Huh? We have light. Mr. Cliver sees the light. Speak.
um, to highlight um, Red Ribbon Week, we are doing a drug prevention assembly today. Um, I'm gonna introduce Phil O'Hara. Phil O'Hara is a former student athlete who had a promising future ahead of him. A simple trip to the dentist sent his life in a direction no one had suspected. His college wrestling career took a back seat to his opioid addiction. Doing whatever he needed to feed his addiction, Philip completely abandoned his moral compass, doing whatever he needed to do to find the next high. After a seven year battle with opioids, finding himself completely broken and alone, he finally made the call for help and hasn't looked back. Since finding recovery, Philip has been, has been certified as a recovery coach, certified peer recovery specialist, and has trained with world renowned motivational speaker, Les Brown. Earning his certificate as a certified motivational speaker and coach through the Les Brown Institute. It's been Phil's mission to share his story with young people and attempt to educate them on the dangers of drug abuse. Please give him your attention, Phil O'Hara. Good morning, guys. All right, that was like really weak. We're gonna try that again. Good morning, guys. All right, that was a little better. Um, this is my first uh, school in like two years because of COVID. So uh, I've done so many of these schools that it just became like second nature. But like for the first time in two years, I actually am kind of nervous and have butterflies because I haven't done this in two years. So um, for the next hour, don't look at the ceiling. Dude. I'm gonna be up here for an hour. Don't look at the ceiling. I'm gonna talk to you guys about vaping, drugs, and alcohol. Who wants to look at the ceiling right now? Raise your hands. Because th you guys failed right off the rip, this whole row, what? Show of hands, who wants to look at the ceiling right now? Dude, I know it's early, but like, everybody's head went up. My problem with drugs and alcohol is that we lie to you guys. We tell you, just say no, don't do it. Right, but immediately everyone's like, why am I not doing this? I wanna do this, right? We don't tell you guys the truth. The first time, seventh grade, I drank alcohol. Um, it was New Year's Eve, we were at my friend's, uh, my friend's house. We snuck, um, we snuck some, uh, I don't know, some type of drink upstairs. Uh, I drank some, and what did they not tell me about my first drink? They told me it was bad, they told me it was gonna ruin my life, but what did they not tell me about it? They didn't tell me it was gonna feel good, right? So I drank, right, I physically felt good. I drank a little bit more, I felt better. After about an hour, I got the courage to call this girl Danielle Marone. She, I had a crush on her since the fifth grade, right? Uh, I, turns out she had a crush back. I asked her to be my girlfriend, right? I woke up the next day with a headache and a girlfriend. Did that ruin my life? No, that was like an upgrade, right? Like my life got better that night. So instantly, everything they told me about drugs and alcohol went right out the window with my first drink, right? They don't tell you it makes you feel good. You know, we just came off a lockdown, right? Uh, over this lockdown, we saw alcohol alcoholism skyrocket in people that were not typically alcoholics. Overdose rates jumped from 72,000 to 93,000 in one year. Why? Right, because drugs and alcohol make you feel good and it's an escape, right? So when you're locked in a house and you're you know, driven by fear and all this stuff, you escape with drugs and alcohol, right? And that's what we don't tell you guys. We don't tell you that off the rip, it makes you feel good. And I'm not here to lie to you guys. I'm here to give you my whole story, the truth about my story and allow you guys as the educated young adults that you are, because you are, to make your own decisions. I'm not here to tell you to do anything. Why am I up here? Why do they bring me here? Why do they fly me across the country to talk to kids? I've been in Texas, Ohio, Indiana, South Carolina, uh, Wisconsin. It's to encourage you guys to talk, right? Whether it's with me or somebody else. And for whatever reason, um, you know, you guys are afraid to talk to your teachers, you're afraid to talk to your parents, but when they bring in the tattooed bald guy, you guys are like, all right, he's cool, I'll talk to him. So at any point during this uh, uh, speech or whatever you wanna call it, um, if I say anything that strikes a chord with you guys, if I talk about something that you guys can relate to, 
and you want to talk to me about it, I'll be up here afterwards. At the end, I'll leave my Instagram tag up there because a lot of you guys are afraid to come up in front of your peers. You can shoot me a message. If something's going on that you guys need to talk about, we'll work through it. But that's why I'm here. My main reason I'm here is to get you guys to talk. Um, the name of this presentation is Stay in Your Lane. What does that mean? It means being yourself, focusing on your education, positive friends and family, uh, positive friends, positive decisions. Let's skip to f connecting with five trusted adults. Um, this is huge with me, right? Uh, I truly believe that you are the five people you surround yourself with. Um, you're gonna hear through my story, it got really crazy. And uh, when I was at my worst and I was looking at you know, going to prison, the guys that I was surrounded with were all guys that were in and out of jail and guys that were committing crimes, right? So it makes sense that that's what was going on in my life, right? Water finds its level. So what really changed my life was I started removing toxic people and I started finding mentors, people that could show me things, people that had something I wanted, not necessarily like money, but like they, they had a job that they liked or they had a career path that I was interested in. They had done that job for 15 years. I attached myself to those people and I learned valuable lessons from them and that's why I am where I am today, right? Connecting with five trusted adults. Um, standing up to bullying, this is a big one for me. Um, you know, you never know what's going on with somebody um, and I wonder, how many um, awful events and awful tragedies that we hear about in schools could be averted by that one person talking to somebody else, right? So there was a kid when I was in school, his name was Dave. Um, he sat alone at lunch every day. He had busted shoes from the year before. He was never put together. And like people thought he was weird and just kind of left him to himself, right? Um, I became friends with Dave later on in life, and as we got older, uh, I, I found out what was going on that whole time. His mom was an alcoholic, his father was dead, and he was living with his grandmother, right? And grandma was kind of like angry at his mom that, that, that she had to raise another kid in her golden years. So he didn't get enough money for clothes, Right? He didn't have any friends at school, but what none of us knew is that when we went home, he, he went home to a grandmother that was just abusive and, and yelled at him all the time. Right, So what he told me, and it was like something that broke my heart in my 20s, was the best part of his day in high school was lunch when he sat alone because he wasn't getting yelled at and he wasn't getting made fun of. Right? Like that, when you like really think about that, right, that's kind of a sad story. Right? None of us really want somebody around us, whether we like them or not, to really be suffering like that. Right? So I challenge you guys to think about that one person that you know is kind of on the outs right now. There's got to be somebody that comes to mind when I tell this story. And be a leader. Step aside from everybody that kind of picks on this kid and maybe go up to him and just say, hey, how are you doing? You all right? Is everything okay? Is there anything I could do to help you? You're going to see something, right? Not only are you gonna see that kid's day change, but you're gonna feel good, right? The best way I could describe this is, you know, when I'm online at 7-Eleven and some kid comes up to buy candy, and I don't know if anybody's ever been on food stamps, but that New Jersey EBD card, that food stamp card, I know what it looks like because I've been on food stamps. And when I see a little kid with that card and he's swiping it at 7-Eleven and it's getting declined, right? And I got like three grown men that drove up in Mercedes behind them just like getting frustrated because the line's taking too long. I'm the one that steps out of line and swipes my card for this kid to get his Snickers. Often for the kid to kind of look up at me like, hey, creepy guy, why are you paying for my candy? Like str stranger danger, right? He looks at me kind of weird, doesn't even say thank you, and he runs out the door, right? But I get in the car, my wife looks at me and says, why do you have that stupid smile on your face? I don't know, a little kid wanted a Snickers, I got him a Snickers, right? You guys have to be the change. You guys have to be the ones to start looking out for others and helping them. And you're gonna, be, you're gonna get rewarded from it you will feel uh, positive when you step up that way. Uh, respecting yourself and others, staying away from alcohol, saying no to vaping and e-cigarettes. Who in here vapes? Show of hands. Nobody. Not one guy or girl. Okay, 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 I got another question, I got another question. Who in here knows someone in here who vapes? Show of hands. 
<laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Just checking. That game works everywhere. All right, so before I get into the vaping and all that stuff, I'm going to tell you guys about my story. Um, this is me as a little kid. I was a normal kid. I was a happy kid. Um, uh, I told you guys about my first drink, right? Seventh grade. Um, yeah, that was cool, right? That was a lot of fun. Everything they taught me went right out the window. Drugs and alcohol are clearly not bad. Adults drink, right? So I just, it's just part of the curriculum. They gotta teach us it's bad, right? Um, I get to high school. Wrestling is a big part of my story. Um, that was kind of like my saving grace in high school. Um, so I smoked pot for the first time, like, yeah, that was all right. Uh, but my life really changed my sophomore year. My sophomore year, I had to go to the dentist, had to get my tooth pulled, right? I left that dentist with a prescription of antibiotics and a prescription of opioid painkillers. Now, you guys know what opioids are, right? We've done a great job of educating you guys about the people that die every year. Cool. Well, this was 2001, right? I know I'm ancient. You guys probably weren't born yet. Um, so there wasn't 93,000 people dying a year, right? Actually, at this time, Big Pharma was telling us that these pills were non-addictive. So when I got these pills, my mom had no idea what they were. She let me have a bottle of painkillers. Um, I, uh, I go back to wrestling practice. Uh, I take these two pills before practice. Um, I walk into practice, and the first thing I notice is like, whoa. Like, I feel good. Like, I take them, and I could feel them entering my body like a warm blanket, right? And I'm like, whoa, what is that? Um, I'm not very flexible. This is as far as I go. But, you know, opioids mess with your pain receptors, so that part of your brain that says, like, ow, stop, that hurts, I don't feel that, right? So my hand goes and touches the floor, and I was like, whoa, what is that? And, like, I know immediately, like, painkiller, pain, got it, cool. So they make me more flexible. Um, and I got this boost of energy. Um, anybody ever taken a Benadryl? Show of hands if you've taken a Benadryl. Keep your hands up if Benadryl makes you tired. All right, hands down. Anybody ever taken a Benadryl and not getting tired, gotten tired? Ah, there's always a few of us, right? Do you know why you don't get tired? You have a physical allergy. I have a physical allergy to Benadryl. What that means is my body has an adverse reaction. So if it says drowsy, I don't get drowsy. I get awake, right? Opioids are a downer, they're a depressant, they're supposed to make you tired. However, when I take them, I don't get tired, I get awake. I have a genetic predisposition to opioid addiction. That allergy right there is not how it's supposed to work in your body. So that allergy kicks in and I get all this energy um, and wrestling practice starts, I take a shot, my head bounces off somebody else's head, I can't really feel it. Coach blows the whistle to run sprints. I can't feel my legs. I can run as many sprints as you want. In fact, I have so much energy, I'm winning the sprints. I walk out of that wrestling practice, and I have the best wrestling practice I've ever had in my life. Again, I had another very positive experience with something that told me was supposed to be bad. Um, flash forward to my senior year. Uh, we're wrestling Del Val in the state sectional finals. Um, my coach comes up to me in wrestling practice, uh, in school, I'm sorry, comes up to me in school and says, uh, hey, listen, I got to bump you up a weight class to wrestle Chris Sigafoos. Well, this kid Sigafoos, the year before, he tech falled my room partner, Kevin. If you don't wrestle or follow wrestling, a tech fall is when you beat somebody by 15 or more points. They just stop the match. It's like a mercy rule in baseball, right? So. Kevin, the kid that he tech falled last year, is my room partner. And I practice with Kevin every single day, and my entire life I have never been able to score one point on this kid, right? So coach comes up to me and tells me that I have to wrestle the guy that beats up the guy that beats me up every single day. You guys follow me? So I know this is gonna be a tough match. Um, I find my friend Anthony. Anthony was paralyzed on the football field that year against Manasquan. He got hit so hard on the kickoff um, that fluid built up on his spine and compressed against his spine, and for three weeks he couldn't feel his legs. He was in a hospital for three weeks. Finally, around like the second week, they started to drain the blood away, and he slowly began feeling. After about a month, he came out of the hospital. He came out of that hospital with severe nerve pain and damage. He came out of that hospital with five different narcotic 
medications. They gave them opioids for the pain, they gave them Xanax for the anxiety of not being able to walk again. Uh, they gave them some other drug called gabapentin, which was like a neuro drug. They gave them a laundry list of drugs, right? We gave a 15-year-old kid with an undeveloped brain and an undeveloped prefrontal cortex a laundry list of narcotic medications. <clears throat> 10 years later, that very same kid on those very same drugs um, got in a car, picked up his 19-year-old passenger, took a bunch of pills, fell asleep at the wheel, he nodded off at the wheel, and he crashed full speed into the back of a flatbed truck, killing his 19-year-old passenger. My friend Anthony uh, got sentenced to seven years in state prison. Um, I talked to him through this app on my phone called JPay. He's actually, I guess there's a prison like close to here. He's, he's here, he's like 30 minutes from here. Um, and you know, this accident happens and everyone starts calling me and says, you know, I can't believe this happened. How did this happen? Anthony was such a good kid. And you know, I work in the addiction field at this point and I get really frustrated with everybody asking me how. We gave a kid a bunch of drugs. The reward center in his brain, before it was developed, took those drugs, recognized them as good, and for the rest of his life, his body and his brain craved those drugs more than it craved food. If he had $10 left, and it was a choice between eating food and taking drugs, he would take drugs. And we didn't even have a shot. Um, <clears throat> The younger that you guys use substances, the more your chances of, uh, of becoming an addict later in life um, skyrocket. They skyrocket. All right, so back to my, uh, my high school days. So I go up to Anthony, I get these two pills. Um, I said, yo, dude, I need a couple of painkillers. I got a big match tonight. What does Anthony say? He's my best friend. He said, no, you shouldn't do that. I'm just joking, that's not what he said. <laughs> he was like, here you go, dude, here's some drugs. Um, I go to the match, I take them, I feel that, that energy. Um, long story short, I go into overtime. Somehow, it's a 3-3 match, I end up in overtime. Um, as soon as I put my foot on the line, I knew I was gonna win that match because this kid couldn't even pick his body up. Um, I had all that energy, right? So. Whistle blows, he shoots in, I spin behind, I score two points, I win, and we go on to win the first state sectional championship in my high school's history, and I won the match for my team high on Percocet. Who is gonna tell me at 17 years old that drugs are bad after winning that match? I'm sorry, that might be your experience, that might be your experience, that's not my experience. In my experience, sitting in your shoes, these substances actually made me better. Um, I go to college, I fail out of college rather quickly. I am dyslexic and I have ADHD, something I didn't understand until later on in life. I have a hard time reading. It takes me forever to read a book. It doesn't mean I can't learn things. I just don't learn the way that this is set up. Um, so I fail out of college really quickly. Um, I get into the Stone Setters Union in Manhattan. This is me standing 42, or 42 stories in the air on First Avenue. Um, I bought a Harley, who's cooler than me at 21 years old. Nobody? You guys are like, come on, I know it's early. I'm trying to get something out of you. Um, so I'm working in the union, and uh, this guy has a bottle of pills rattling, rattling around in his tool bag, and like, I see, you know, Oxy on there, and I'm like, yo, dude, let me get one of those pills. He's like, no, 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 dude, we gotta work today. I'm like, no, listen, we have a lot of work to do today. Give me one of those pills, watch what happens. He gives me one, and we normally do like four rows of stone. We did like six that day. At the end of the day, he's like, kid, that was, you did great today. I'm like, yeah, bring me more of those pills tomorrow, and we could do that again. He's like, you don't have to buy them off me. You got your insurance, right? I said, yeah, I got my insurance. He said, you could just go to the doctor and get them yourself. Right? Just tell me you have pain here and tell me you have pain here and just lean a certain way when you walk through the door. They'll write you as many as you want. 
This whole opioid epidemic, this 93,000 people that died every year, it started because guys like me and him took advantage of a system that was broken and got doctors to overprescribe us medication that we didn't need. And the streets of this country were flooded with opioid painkillers. He said, kid, I don't even take all these pills. I take about 50 and I sell the other 50 and I made about $2,000 last month. I was like, really, right? I'm 22 years old, I like money. Um, and this is where my life really took a right hook, right? I, 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 I kinda abandoned all of my friends, I abandoned all of the mentors and good people I had in my life, and I go full time into, into selling p pills. Um, you know, this was my weekend every single weekend. Um, looks pretty funny, right? Um, at the time, <clears throat> I thought this was funny. I made this my Facebook profile picture because like, look how messed up we were, right? That was the mindset that I was in. I really hadn't seen any negative consequences from my drug use yet. I was making a ton of money and I was having a lot of fun, right? Something they never told me in school was gonna happen. They always told me it was gonna ruin my life. Well, my life hadn't gotten ruined yet. Um, from 23 to 26, I was a full-time criminal. Um, I kind of got lost in that delusion. A lot of movies were, you know, watched, and like everything gets kind of glorified. So, like, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm loving what I'm doing. Until 26 years old, um, my life really, really took a turn for the worst. Uh, anybody ever see those black boxes on the back of cop cars? Do you know what it is, Mr. Red Mask? No idea, right? It's a plate scanner. So if you're like me, you guys are seniors, right? You guys are driving, right? Pay your tickets, because if you don't pay your ticket, the DMV will suspend your license, and I was notorious for that. So I had an unpaid ticket, and I knew my license was suspended, and I've passed these plate scanners before, and every time I pass one, I'm like, oh God, here we go, I get pulled over. Well, <clears throat> I'm driving this one morning, and I passed my first plate scanning cop, and I don't get pulled over. And I was like, ooh, that was lucky, right? Um, I passed my second plate scanning cop. This time, he's going this way, I'm going that way, there's one of those concrete barriers in the way, so I see him, I'm like, oh man, you know, I'm about to get pulled over. And uh, for whatever reason, he doesn't turn around. Right? I don't know if maybe the plate didn't scan or he just was too busy, but like now, I'm kinda like nervous. I'm like on edge, I'm like, whoa, I passed two and I didn't get pulled over, like, this is a bad day. Finally, I passed my third plate scanning cop. Uh, this guy was backed into a Krausers and literally looking to pull people over. And I drove right by him and he looked at me and I looked at him and I look in my rear view mirror and he doesn't pull out. And it was at that moment I knew I wasn't getting pulled over for a reason. I was getting followed. Right, That's, that was my immediate reaction. Um, I turned my car around, made a left. Uh, I drove right to my mom's office. Um, anybody ever seen Goodfellas? You know the part with the helicopters? <laughs> it looks like crap, right? Helicopters. That's what I looked like. I ran into my mom's office. I was ghosted white. I was strung out from using drugs. I ran into my mom's office. I said, Mom, uh, I'm in trouble, I'm getting followed by the cops. My mom is a little tiny woman. She's like, slow down, slow down, what's going on? I said, Mom, I'm gonna go to prison. My mom, a uh, little town council woman, uh, she's on the board of ed for my town. My mom has never committed a crime in her life. I tell my mom I'm in trouble and I'm gonna go to prison. <clears throat> my mom says, okay, I'll get you a plane ticket. We'll fly you to Florida. You can go stay with Aunt Donna, right? But what I couldn't tell my mom was that I was hopelessly addicted to drugs. I have no idea where to get drugs in Florida. And without drugs, I'm gonna get sick, so there's no way I'm going to Florida. Like, you're out of your mind, I'm not going to Florida. Um, without a hesitation, I said, I'm not going to Florida. She says, okay, I'll rent a car, I'll put you in the trunk, and I'll drive you to Florida. Um, thank you, little gangster lady. Uh, never committed a crime in your life, but you're gonna harbor a fugitive and drive 18 hours in the car with me in the trunk. Um, no, I, 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 uh, I don't do that, right? Um, I decide to go turn myself in for the suspended license, uh, and I 
rolled the dice. You know, either they're going to arrest me because they have enough to charge me, or I've watched enough law and order that if they let me go, then there's, they don't have enough to prosecute me. So I go in to pay that suspended license, and they let me go. <clears throat> so I know that they're just following me at this point, um, and, uh, and that's when I made the decision uh, to go get help, right? To go, uh, it, it, it was time. It was time for me to leave. Um, I got on a plane, uh, and I entered into a detox facility. Um, this is my intake picture at detox. So you guys remember I told you like in the beginning it was a lot of fun and it felt good? Does this look like it feels good? Anybody, you could like speak out loud your opinion about this picture. No, right? I look like death. What they don't tell you is that, yeah, it does, it, it, it does feel good in the beginning. But over time, it goes from feeling good to not always feeling good to kind of becoming a full-time job to being a living nightmare, right? Every single day I woke up, I had to find some type of substance to put in my body, not even to get high anymore, just to feel normal. Just to be able to have a regular day, I needed to put some type of substance in my body. Um, I made a decision inside that treatment center that, uh, you know, everyone talks tough, right? Like, oh, I'll go to prison, I'll do that, but like, and I was one of those guys, right? Like. Uh, until I was actually looking at going to prison. And the truth is, uh, this tough guy got really scared really quick. Right? I, I went from being like a tough drug dealer to like a scared little boy that just didn't want to get in trouble. Um, and I knew that. I knew that sitting inside that, dr that treatment center and I made a decision that I was gonna change my life. Um, this guy right here, this is my friend Richie Bryant. Uh, he was on that wrestling team that I told you about. He went to treatment a couple years earlier. When I needed help, he's the guy I called. I told you guys, I'm here to get you guys to talk. Well, the hardest thing I had to do was call this guy and say, listen, I needed help. Thank God he was at the other end of that phone because he got me on a plane and he put me in that treatment center. And those mentors that I told you about and the ne removing negative people and putting positive people in, this was the first big uh, addition to my life. For the first year, he was on me and made sure I did the right thing. Um, over the next five years, my life changed in a way that I never thought it could. Um, I, uh, I got trained to be a recovery coach. I got trained to be a motivational speaker. Uh, I got more mentors. Uh, real quick, so this is my mom the night before I left. Uh, you could see I looked sunken out and not that good, but look at my mom. How does my mom look? kind of stressed out, right? This is my mom three years later, me sober. You see the difference in both of our faces? The truth is, I wasn't just killing myself, right? My actions, they were destroying people around me. I just, I couldn't see it, right? It's hard to see the picture when you're the frame. Get it, picture, frame, right? It's hard to see that. Um, but I just wanted to show you that real quick before I continued. So, this is my wrestling coach. Uh, you know, he's, he's helped me tremendously in this process, and then by far one of the biggest mentors that have ever come into my life is this man right here, Michael DeLeon. Uh, he started the Steered Straight program. You know, and I, I had this goal, I made a decision I wanted to speak in schools, and I wasn't sure how I was gonna do it, and I, I went to this conference, and, and I heard him speak, and I went up to him afterwards, and I said, hey listen, you speak all over the country, like I wanna do this, how could I do this? And he said, you could just do it with me. I was like, wait, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, I need speakers. Like, if you're willing to go all over the country, I have schools for you to go to. Uh, one encounter with one man completely changed my life. I said, yeah, I'm on board. I, I, I gotta talk to these kids about the opioid epidemic. Oh, the opioid, I gotta talk to them about the opioid epidemic. He said, yeah, yeah, you're gonna talk to them about the opioid epidemic, but you're gonna talk to them about marijuana and vaping. And I was like, dude, what? Like, you want me to talk to kids about vaping e-cigarettes and smoking weed? Like, dude, I, I, don't, I, I don't know. So he said, just meet me. I want to I wanna show you these slides. I'm gonna, show, I'm, I'm gonna explain to you uh, why you need to talk to these kids about marijuana and vaping. So I met with him and he started talking to me about the trifecta gateway. He said, Phil, go back to your treatment center later today and ask every single kid inside that facility what was the first three drugs they started with. 
I guarantee you every single one started with alcohol, nicotine, and marijuana. Every single one. Uh, and I mean, I thought about it real quick right at the table and I was like, yeah, that was my first three drugs. Um, so I went back and he was right. He said, Phil, this isn't about specific drugs. This is about kids and their brains, right? I told you guys earlier, the younger you guys use drugs, um, the more susceptible you are to addiction, right? Has anybody dealt with addiction in their family or friends, anybody, right? Way too many people. Very typically, we as people struggling with substance abuse, uh, we do things that we're not proud of. We harm people around us. Why is that? Why is it that somebody that I know loves me could do something that hurts me so bad? You guys have something in your brain called the prefrontal cortex. This is the area of your brain that controls all rational thoughts, such as, I love my mom, I shouldn't steal my mom's jewelry to pawn it for drugs. However, when you're completely addicted to substances, this area of the brain completely turns off. It shuts down. If you put my addicted brain on a brain scan in 2014, it's completely black. It does not light up blue like the rest of my brain. It takes 18 months for that rational decision-making part of your brain to turn back on. So why do they call addiction a disease? Because it's a brain dis-ease. You don't have a brain for 18 months. You're running on this part of your brain. This part of your brain controls survival instinct, right? Such as don't get sick. Survival to a drug addict is don't get sick. Now there's another way I could shut down your prefrontal cortex without drugs. Like I said, this is the survival part of your brain. So when you're in a life or death situation and you have seconds to act, you're not thinking rationally, you're going on survival instinct, right? So who could tell me, first of all, give me two people that are friends. Raise your hand, two people sitting next to each other that are friends. You guys, what's your name? What? Oh, 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 okay, let's go with Lexi and McKenna. Sorry, guys. Lexi and McKenna back there, right? Raise your hands. You guys been friends a long time? You, you tight? You guys are cool? All right. Hypothetically, I put a, a glass cage around this room, and I suck all the air out of this room right now, and there's only one small hole over there to escape, and only one person can get out. What's gonna happen when I suck the air out of this room? What? But what's gonna happen before that? Are you guys gonna try and run to that door? You are. If she's in your way, and you gotta get out to live, is she still your friend? No. If I sucked the air out of this room right now and there was a stampede to that door, you guys would tear each other to shreds. You two, right here. You would use her head to open that door. <laughs> because you're not thinking rationally. You're not thinking like, hey, this is my friend. I got her shoes on from last week. She let me borrow. I love her to death. No, you're thinking, she's in my way and I'm gonna die. Sorry, dude, you're dead. Right, and that's what you're dealing with with people in active addiction. They're just trying to survive. So to anybody in this room that has been hurt by a loved one, dude, they, it's not that they don't love you, they're just really sick and we need to help them. Um, so, 90% of drug and alcohol abuse starts in their, kid, starts in their teens. 90% of people that ended up like me started right here. The longer that you guys wait to try any type of substance, the better off you are. Um, so right now, in the biggest drug epidemic that this country has ever seen, you guys are being targeted and you guys are being lied to. Um, vaping has exploded in middle schools and high schools. Um, you guys have been told 
that this is a safer alternative to smoking. Who believes that? Who believes that vaping is actually safer than smoking cigarettes? Show of hands. You do? Anybody else? Nobody at this point? Three people? That's it? Or are you guys just really tired? You're kind of on the fence about it, right? There is no statistical information that cigarettes are safer or that vaping is safer than cigarettes. Do you want to know why they lied to you? Do you want to know why that vaping came out? You guys know what a vape is, right? We only have an hour. I don't have to go through this. This is more for when I do the parent academies. Some mom's like, I thought that was a USB. <laughs> All right, so here, wait, what'd you say? What if you vape water? That is an excellent question, and I'm going to get to that because you're not vaping water, but I'm going to show you what you are vaping. All right, so here's how you're being targeted. Um, 8 million through magazines, 9.6 million through TV, 14.4 million are exposed at retail schools, retail stores. This is my favorite one to talk about because when you guys leave this school, you can see it. Right? You ever go to Wawa? You notice down low, either on the, those bollards so you don't crash into the building, or real low on the glass, they have these tobacco ads. <laughs> Whose eyes are down low? Kids, right? They're never up high, they're fruity pebbles right at eye level. Because kids are the ones that are being targeted. 2016, 32% of high school kids were smoking cigarettes. Now this is from 2016. What do you think the percentages are now of high school kids that are vaping? You too, what? I, you gotta talk louder, you got mask, you're not really into it. 70%, what about you? 90% of high school kids, right? So we'll say 60 to 90%, depending on the school. Can we agree on that? Right, okay. So right here, this red line, this is my freshman year in high school. Vaping wasn't a thing yet. 28% of high school kids were smoking cigarettes in 2000, right? Remember that commercial, Truth, the orange commercial with the, with the blue bubbles? Now they're finally talking about vaping. But it was like an anti-tobacco campaign. Well, that came out, right? That came out. We started educating kids that cigarettes were killing people. And we were making progress. And slowly but surely, less and less and less and less kids were smoking cigarettes, down to about 15%, almost half of what it was a decade prior. And what happened? What happened when Big Tobacco started losing all that money? Magically, in 2011, a safer alternative to smoking came out. And this big disinformation and lie campaign happened. And we see this purple number start to rise. We said we were at 32% in 2016, and now we're at 60 to 90%. We took teen use rate from 30% up to, we doubled it. We doubled it. You guys are money. That's it. There's some guy at a big tobacco office that truly does not care about your future. He just cares about the bottom line in dollars. He might tell his kids, like, hey, listen, stay away from the vaping, but he doesn't care about you guys, right? You guys are the target. Do you think I'm smoking Fruity Pebbles? I mean, like, some of my friends are. I kind of make fun of them, but no, right? Kids are the target. That's why they make flavored juice. So what are we smoking? We're not smoking water vapor. That's a big myth. You're smoking propylene glycol, liquid nicotine, and vegetable uh, vegetable oil. This is a vape kit. This is an at-home vape kit. There's rubber gloves in every kit. Anybody know why there's rubber gloves in the kit? It's not for when you put the two big bottles in. It's for when you take this syringe over here and you get that liquid nicotine. Why? Because if you get too much of that liquid nicotine on your skin, it could absorb into your skin, giving you nicotine poisoning. So let me get this straight. I'm going to put these gloves on. I'm going to put it into my vape, making sure it doesn't touch my skin because that could harm me. I'm going to put it into my tank. I'm going to heat it up to like 300, 200 something degrees and 
blow out a giant vape cloud. Maybe make a ring, do the, do the thing where it shoots across the room. Does that make sense to you guys? You don't want to get it on your skin, but you're going to heat it up and put it in your lungs. So the other thing that you guys are going to start seeing is that vapes are going to be the next big drug delivery system. In Australia, they, uh, they made a giant bust. 200 liters of liquid methamphetamine came into the country. And the news wrote it up that, you know, this is a new smuggling method, and then they take the liquid and they turn it into methamphetamine. No, that's not the truth. That was it in its finished form. The point of that liquid methamphetamine is because it's vapable. You are going to start seeing this as the big drug delivery system. Everyone freaks out in Philadelphia and Kensington when they see people shooting up drugs on the street, but you're not going to know when somebody's walking by you at a restaurant. We see it now. People are smoking weed in restaurants, and people have no idea. Um, side note, who knows what a dab is? All right, we're going to get to this, because this is... This part, I didn't believe until I saw it from my own eyes. Um, so this is a jewel. This is the most popular uh, version of you guys smoking. Um, jewel uses uh, something called the nicotine salt. Nicotine salt more closely resembles the natural structure of nicotine found in tobacco leaves. Uh, nicotine salts are more readily absorbed into the bloodstream, crossing the blood-brain barrier. This affects your brain more, right? So remember I told you about Anthony and what happened to his brain and how he used drugs at a young age, right? So I was against us talking to you guys about nicotine until I truly understood this fact. Nicotine is the most addictive substance we have, right? It's more addictive than heroin. I've been in treatment with people that have come off of every other drug, but when I try and take cigarettes away from them, they're like, dude, no way. I'm not giving up cigarettes, right? We have 60 to 90% of our high schoolers and 30 to 50% of our middle schoolers addicted to a substance that we can't help them get off of. So if addiction is a progressive disease and the longer, younger you use, the more susceptible you are, right? If I'm addicted, to nicotine, how much time I got, 10 minutes? If I'm addicted to nicotine at 13, and it's a progressive disease, what am I gonna be addicted to at 20? What am I gonna be addicted to at 25, right? It's way more serious than we think it is. You guys are priming your brain for addiction. This, and I said it two years ago before the lockdown happened. This 72,000 people, it's gonna get worse. And what happened? It jumped almost 30% to 93,000. And next year, it's gonna be worse again. We are not making progress. We are getting worse when it comes to this. So let's, I got 10 minutes, so what I wanna really skip to is real quick what you're smoking. You're smoking formaldehyde, propylene glycol, decidal, lead, nickel, and then these last three I stopped trying to pronounce because you guys make fun of me. Remember, I'm dyslexic. Don't hold it against me. Uh, Dicidal is a highly toxic chemical compound that is very dangerous to not only people who work with it, but also to consumers. Dicidal exposure can cause permanent, severe, and potential lethally lung disease in workers and consumers. Um, this is the top three leading causes of death in this country. Heart disease is number one, cancer is number two, respiratory disorders is number three. Over the next decade, you are going to see respiratory disorders overtake cancer as a leading cause of death in this country, directly because of vaping. Popcorn lung, acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, hospitalizations are up, people have died. But real quick, THC, we're legalizing THC in this, in this state, right? Weed's good, right? No criminal charges for people for smoking weed. The problem is that our legislators have no idea what they're actually legalizing. When we legalized marijuana in, in Colorado, we turned it over to commercial scientists. Big corporations started messing with the weed itself. This is THC rates uh, from 1960 to 2015 um, when we legalized it. 12% was the highest that it got. When I was in high school, the weed that we were smoking, the best weed I could get was 12% THC. Since we legalized it, I'm sorry, in 2013, 
and we handed it over to the scientists in Colorado with, with GMOs and pesticides and science, they have taken it from 12, 13% up to 35% in the bud itself, right? That's not, that's not natural, that's science. We took it a step further. We took that genetically modified weed, we shot butane and propane through that weed, coming up with this, dabs, highly concentrated THC oil. Guys, I, I, I have to be 100% transparent with you. When they told me that this was gonna start causing psychosis, I was like, get out of here, you're lying. I have done five interventions in the last three years of young people that were 100% out of their minds, out of their minds, hearing voices, seeing demons. And I thought, my first experience, I thought the guy was on methamphetamine. Like, this is what I do, I work in the field. I do interventions all the time. When I did the drug test on this kid, the only thing in the system was THC. They're shooting butane and butane and propane through this stuff. When there's too much of the butane left over, that's what you guys are smoking, and that's what your brain is taking, right? So some people, are they able to take a dab and not get messed up for the rest of their lives? Yeah, but dude, there's a percentage of people that it turns them into bipolar schizophrenics, and nobody's talking about this. Governments aren't talking about it. Legislators aren't talking about it. Why? Because they're going to tax it, and they're going to make a ton of money off of it. And really, if a couple people go crazy, who cares? We're going to make a bunch of money, right? You guys have to be aware of this. 98, what is it? 89%, 83%, spicy white devil, green love potion. 87% THC. This right here is 100% THC. Um, I did an intervention a couple weeks ago and the guy had five jars of this. And he was completely out of his mind. I had to call the state police because we were in some area of North Jersey that doesn't even have a local police department. They have state police. Do they have that down here too? So the state police had to come and put him in a crisis unit. Um, parents have no idea, like he's just smoking weed, like we're cool with this. Um, get to the vaping deaths. Uh, nine people went to the hospital uh, in 2016 by, I'm sorry, not 2016, uh, 2019. By the end of 2020, those hospital rates were up to 230 people. Who here has heard that vaping is only uh, hurting people that smoke weed? Anybody heard that, right? The only people that's having respiratory issues from, from vapes are the ones that are smoking the bootleg THCs. Has anybody heard that? Because that's a lie. Of the 514 cases we have data on, um, 36 stated only THC, 16% only nicotine. So it's another lie that they're telling you, right? Just don't smoke THC and you won't have lung issues. Um, Cannabis-induced psychosis has increased 600% among adults and 1,500% in adolescents since 2019. You are going to see more of this. Uh, hospital rates have more than doubled, um, and uh, respiratory, just, uh, respiratory rates have doubled. Chemically-induced comas and people have died. So here's, here's what I want to leave you guys with. Right? The choice is yours on what to do. I know that I cannot come in here and tell you guys to do anything. If I was that good, I would be making a lot of money and I would be flying across the country like they'd be flying me around the world. Um, I'm not that powerful, I'm not that good. This is what I wanna leave you with. The younger that you guys use, the worse off you are. You have a lot of time to be an adult. Right, you have a lot of time to try certain things. Your brain does not fully develop till you're 26 years old. So my wife, who never really drank or did anything uh, until she got to college, she could have a drink. She could have a glass of wine and finish the bottle, I mean finish the glass of wine and not finish the bottle. Yeah, you know, depends on the day, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, 
but the younger that you guys are, the more susceptible you are. So I'm not asking you to wait till you're 26, that's a tall ask. I'm not even asking you to wait till you're 21, because uh, I know that's a lot to ask. I'm asking you to, to fight as long as you can. Wait as long as you can to try anything, if you have to. Because uh, the longer you wait, the, 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 the less chance you have. Right, that's the best thing I could ask you guys to do. Um, what do we got, a minute? So, again, I'm a little rusty. I haven't done this in two years, sorry guys. But, if anything I said, uh, if you have something going on in your home, right, if you have addiction in your home, I can't tell you how many times I've done these speeches and ended up doing an intervention later that night because somebody's mom or dad has a problem and you guys are so afraid to tell anybody about it because they're gonna rip you from the home if you tell somebody. If you guys have something going on that you need to talk about and you're afraid to talk to me about it here or something like that, my information is right there. Um, shoot me a message and I'll figure out how to help you guys. Um, I've had kids come up to me after this, talk about cutting, hey, I've been cutting for the last six months, I don't know how to stop, I don't, I, I, I don't even know what to do, I haven't told anybody. Um, and this lockdown, right, while it was beneficial for uh, saving lives, uh, it doesn't help people with substance abuse disorder. I lost my grandfather to COVID. COVID is very real. But locking you guys down, taking you out of your prom, not allowing you guys to, to, to have school. Somebody in here, when, when we found out we were locking them down, somebody was like, oh man, now I gotta go home and deal with mom or dad, you know? Um, and I'm sorry that that happened to you guys. I'm sorry that you missed a huge chunk of your high school experience. But now more than ever, you guys need to be there for each other. So if you see somebody struggling, say something. If you need me, message me. All right, thank you guys for listening. You were awesome.
All right, guys, at this time, please put your phones away and give your attention to our guest speaker for today. Ms. Basile is going to introduce him. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> All right, so we're going to have a quick introduction. This is Phil O'Hara. He's here to tell you his personal story and the um, effects on drugs. Um, this is to highlight Red Ribbon Week, which is the prevention of drugs. So give him a hand. Make sure your phones are away. Hey, guys. Real quick, has anybody seen me before? Who was here in the middle school besides you guys? All of you? Oh, my God. All right. I'm gonna have to change some stuff up because you guys heard some of this before. But, uh, all right, cool. All right, so I'm gonna be up here for the next hour. For the next hour, don't look at the ceiling. Dude, you guys knew it was coming and you still looked up. For the next hour, don't, uh, don't look at the ceiling. I just saw you, tan shirt person. Um, show of hands, who wants to look at the ceiling right now? Right? Go ahead, look up, get it out of the way. Uh, you feel better? You feel better, right? All right, I feel better too. All right, so we just proved right there that just say no doesn't work, right? I can't come in here and tell you guys not to do something. If you're anything like me, I'm gonna be like, all right, well, I'm gonna do that immediately. So that's not why I'm here. I'm not here to tell you guys just say no. I'm here to tell you guys the truth. I'm here to tell you guys the truth about my story and, uh, and allow you guys to draw your own conclusions, all right? A big part of my problem with how we speak to young people in schools is I think we lie to you guys. I don't think we tell you guys the truth. I don't think we're real enough. I don't think we treat you guys like adults. I think we still treat you guys like your kids and you guys have the internet, so you've been adults since you were like 11. Um, what did they not tell me about drugs and alcohol? Who here has heard drugs and alcohol are bad they're gonna ruin your life? Show of hands, right? Hands down. <clears throat> what did they not tell me about the first time I was gonna drink? Anybody? Go ahead, bud. No, see, all the doom and gloom, that's what you're thinking about. No, they didn't tell me that it was gonna feel good. They didn't tell me it was gonna be fun. So seventh grade, the first time I took a drink, it was New Year's, we were at my friend's, uh, my friend's house, we snuck some alcohol. Uh, I drank some, tasted terrible, but I started to feel good. I drank a little bit more, I felt better. After about an hour, I got the courage to call this girl Danielle Marone. I had a crush on her since the fourth grade. Turns out she had a crush on me back. I asked her to be my girlfriend, she said yes. I woke up the next day with a headache and a girlfriend. Did that ruin my life? You could clap, go ahead buddy, thank you. Did that ruin my life? No, that was like an upgrade. My life got better that day, right? So instantly, everything they told me about drugs and alcohol went right out the window. Right out the window in one, in one night. Clearly, they are lying to me, right? I watch adults drink, so how could it be that bad? Um, I'm gonna get into my story. I'm gonna get into the drugs, the alcohol, the vaping, all that stuff, but why am I here? I'm here to encourage you guys to talk. Why do they fly me across the country to talk to kids? It's because you guys aren't talking. And for whatever reason, um, you're afraid to talk to your teachers, you're afraid to talk to your parents, some of you are afraid to talk to your peers, but when they bring in the tattooed bald guy, you guys are like, hey, he's cool, I'll talk to him, right? So at any point during this speech, hey, I got a water, thank you, hold on. If at any point during the speech, if I say something that you guys can relate to or that you need to talk about, I'll be up here afterwards and we could talk. If you're too afraid to talk to me because people are watching, I'll leave my Instagram up there and you guys could message me when I leave because this is the digital age and you guys don't talk to people. But you'll message me. It's easier, I don't know what it's about, but it works. So. I'm gonna leave my information up there if you guys need me. Oh, sorry. All right. Um, the name of this presentation is called Stay in Your Lane. 
What does that mean? It means being yourself, focusing on your education, um, positive friends, positive decision, communicating with family, connecting with five trusted adults. Let's stop here. <clears throat> this one's really important to me. You're gonna hear throughout my story, it got crazy. Um, the crazier that my life got, the worse the people were around me, right? When I was looking at going to prison, all the guys I was hanging out with were in and out of prison. Um, when I decided to change my life, the hardest thing and the best thing I did for myself was starting cutting negative people out of my life. I started removing people that were not adding value to my life. If you had nothing to teach me, I had no time for you. There's a saying that I really like. If you're the smartest guy in your group or if you're the smartest girl in your group, get a new group, right? Finding mentors, talking to people older than you that have something that you want is huge. Anybody have an older cousin? Not quite like an adult, but like maybe like 20, 21, 22, right? Boom. That is a perfect person for you guys to talk to. If you're going through some stuff that like, you're like, yo, you gotta tell your mom. You're like, mm -mm, nope, nope, no way, right? Call that cousin that's probably been in your shoes, talk to them and have them help you. Like maybe they'll break the news to your parents that they need to find out that you're afraid to tell them, right? Find mentors, people that are older than you to help you. Stand up to bullying, this is a big one for me. Uh, when I was in school, there was a kid named Dave. Everyone made fun of Dave. Dave had some crusty old shoes, um, sat alone at lunch every day. Like nobody really talked to him. I became friends with Dave later on in life. Turns out he was actually really cool. Um, and I met his grandmother once. And now I knew that his mom wasn't around. I didn't know the backstory behind it, but like I knew that he lived with his grandmother. And I met her and she was like a wretched, mean woman. Like, I, no joke, I'm talking to you guys like adults. Something mentally was wrong with her. She had some type of undiagnosed mental health problem, whether it was borderline personality disorder or bipolar or something. She was just mean. Uh, and I was like, oh, wow, you had to live with that? He's like, yeah, dude, like, that's been my whole life. She hates me because she had to raise me and my mom wasn't there. Never had any money for anything. Uh, I came home and I got yelled at all day. And I was like, wow. It's like, you sat alone at lunch all the time. He was like, yeah, honestly, that was the best part of my day. Um, it was the only time I wasn't getting picked on in school and I wasn't getting yelled at at home. I was just alone by myself for an hour. It was the best part of my day. That was a really, really difficult thing to hear, especially knowing that like, I did nothing to contribute in those years to help that kid. He was just suffering silently. Nobody knew. No teachers knew, no friends knew because he didn't have any friends and everyone made fun of him because he didn't have nice shoes. Um, I wonder how many like awful school tragedies, I wonder if just one of those tragedies could have been stopped by another student like just putting their hand on somebody's shoulder and being like, hey, are you okay today? Like, are you good? Like, you don't talk to anybody but like, I'm here if you want to talk. You know, I, I, I wonder if just one of those situations could have been changed. So, you guys, I challenge you to be leaders, right? Think about that one person that you know might be struggling, especially if it's like an underclassman. You guys are juniors, right? Right? So, think about that one kid. Maybe it's a freshman that just kind of is on the outs, super awkward, doesn't talk to anybody. Go up to that kid. You're older than them. They look up to you guys as, as juniors. Ask them, are you okay? Hey, are you all right? Um, you're gonna see something. Not only are you gonna see that kid smile and like a smile that you haven't seen before, but those interactions that you have daily and you know that like, you know that you're making that kid's day with just a five minute conversation every day, you walk away feeling good about yourself. Right, the best way I could describe this is uh, if I'm at 7-Eleven and there's a little kid with a food stamp card, I don't know if anybody's ever on food stamps, but I have, right? I know the card, it's a blue card, it's got a purple tree on it. When I see a kid swipe that card and it's not working and it's getting denied because there's no money left on it and I have like three grown adults who like are got like Louis Vuitton bags and came in in a Mercedes who've never struggled a day in their life and they're like annoyed that this little kid is taking too long uh, I'm the one that steps out of line and swipes my card for $11 for this kid to get his stuff. Often for the kid to look up at me like I'm a creep, 
Like, why are you buying me food, creepy? And not even saying thank you, just like taking his candy and like running out. Doesn't even say thank you. But I get in the car and my wife looks at me and says, you know, like, why do you have that stupid smile on your face? I'm like, I don't, I don't know, a little kid wanted a Snickers bar. I got him a Snickers bar, you know? Every time I step out of my way to help somebody with something, their reaction is, is worth a million dollars, right? It makes me feel, I could be having the worst day possible. Like I could be really mad at how somebody spoke to me at work. Like, do they not know I'm their boss? <laughs> some dumb stuff, some dumb stuff that I make up in my head. And then I have that run in with this kid from 7-Eleven and I'm like, oh wow, you have the ability to help people and like you're not on food stamps anymore. So like stop being a jerk about nobody respecting you. You know what I mean? Like it changes your day. So I challenge you guys to be leaders and start looking around this school for situations that you could be of service to help other people. Uh, respecting yourself, respecting others, staying away from alcohol and all drugs, saying no to vaping and e-cigarettes. We're gonna get to that stuff. But real quick, who in here vapes? Show of hands. One guy. Thank you for being honest. One guy. All right, all right, all right, all right. I got another question, I got another question. Other than, what's your name? Jake, other, other than Jake, I think he just made up his, okay, so I got two honest people. Other than the two honest people, who in here knows someone in here that vapes? Raise a hand. <laughs> you know the only school that that didn't work in was Patterson? Those kids were like, mm -mm, I'm not saying a thing. <laughs> um, no, that game works everywhere except for Patterson. All right, so you guys are vaping. Um, I'm gonna get into my story, and then I'm gonna talk about the vaping, the e-cigarettes, the marijuana, and what's going on. Real quick, I'm gonna run you through my th story a little bit faster than the last class because I wanna focus more on why I'm here. Uh, this is me as a kid, I was a good kid. Um, teachers liked me, I, I wasn't good in school. I have ADHD and I'm dyslexic, so like I was always in the uh, remedial classes. I was classified learning disabled. Um, I kind of always thought that made me like something different. And I could tell you if you are like me and you're classified and you're in the remedial classes, I, I, I'm doing way better in life than a lot of the kids that were in enrichment. We just learn differently. But when we get out in the real world, we still have an ability to comprehend stuff and do stuff. and. Uh, so don't let that hold you back. Uh, a lot of my friends that went to college are not doing, not as happy as I am in life. So I was a good kid in school. I just didn't learn the way that school uh, taught me. The one thing that I excelled in was wrestling. Uh, so that, that was like my saving grace. That was a big part of my story. My wrestling coach, Coach Nooch, that's him. He yells at me still. He still yells at me like that. Um, that was my thing. Uh, I told you I had my first experience with alcohol when I was in seventh grade. That was cool. Everything they taught me went out the window. <clears throat> uh, I smoked pot for the first time in eighth grade. Um, but my life really changed my sophomore year. Uh, I had to get my tooth pulled, uh, and they gave me a prescription um, for opioid painkillers. Now, we've done a great job educating you guys on opiates, right? You guys know what opiates are now? Um, you guys know that 93,000 people died last year of opiates. Anybody lost somebody from addiction in this room? Right, like way too many people. Um, well, when I was at school, uh, I'm ancient. I was in school in 2001, two, three, and four, graduated in 05. Uh, there wasn't 93,000 people, 93, people dying a year. Uh, there wasn't all this education on opioids. We had no idea what they were. In fact, Big Pharma, was telling people that they're non-addictive at this point. So my mom gives me my prescription of painkillers, not knowing what they are. I go back to wrestling practice. I take them in the locker room. Uh, the first thing I notice is I feel them enter my body and I physically feel good, right? Like I could feel them within 30 minutes flowing through my body. I was like, oh, that feels nice. Um, I'm not very flexible. This is as far as I could go. Um, I took that painkiller and it messes with the, you know, I don't feel anything. So I go to stretch and my hand touches the floor and I was like, whoa, that's different. Um, I start to wrestle and I have all this energy. Anybody ever taken a Benadryl? Show of hands if you've taken a Benadryl, hands up. Keep your hands up if Benadryl make you tired. 
Okay, hands down. Um, anybody ever taken a Benadryl and not gotten tired? Do you know why? No. You and I have a physical allergy to Benadryl. What that means is I have an adverse effect, right? Um, I have an opposite reaction. So if the box says drowsy, I don't get drowsy, I get awake. I have that same physical allergy to opioids. Opioids are a downer, they're a depressant, they're supposed to make you tired. However, I have a genetic predisposition that makes me susceptible to opioid uh, addiction. If you have that physical allergy, if you break your bone and you have to take a painkiller, uh, and you notice that like you actually get like wide awake, that's a big red flag that you are genetically predisposed to having an addiction issue with opioids. I have that addiction. Um, I wasn't given the information I just gave you. Uh, I take that pill, I start wrestling at practice, I got all this energy, I'm taking shots, uh, my head's bouncing off somebody else's head, I don't really feel it, coach blows whistle on sprints, I can't feel my legs, I can run as many sprints as you want. In fact, I'm winning every sprint. Um, I walk out of that wrestling practice, I have one of the best wrestling practices I've ever had in my life. Right? I had a very positive experience with something they told me was gonna be bad, again. Um, flash forward to my senior year, my senior year, Coach Newts comes up to me and says, um, hey, I need you to bump up a weight class. You gotta wrestle uh, Chris Sigafoos. Uh, the year before, this kid Sigafoos, he tech falled my room partner, Kevin. Uh, if you don't follow wrestling, uh, a tech fall is when you beat somebody by 15 or more points. It's like a mercy rule in baseball. They just stop the match. Um, Kevin, the kid he tech falled, is my room partner. I have never scored a point on Kevin in my life. Kevin has always beat me. He's just really, really good. So follow me. My wrestling coach comes up to me and tells me that I have to wrestle the guy that beats up the guy that beats me up every single day. You following me? So I go up to my friend Anthony in school. Anthony was paralyzed on the football field that year. He got hit so hard against Manasquan, he had fluid on his spine. Uh, for the first several weeks he was in the hospital, he couldn't feel his legs. He couldn't move at all. After a period of time, they were able to drain the blood away from his spine, he was able to walk again, and he walked out of that hospital about a month later. He walked out of that hospital with five different narcotic pain medications. They gave him opiates for the pain, they gave him Xanax for the anxiety of not being able to walk again, they gave him some other drug for neuro pain, he couldn't feel the tips of his fingers. Uh, we gave a 16-year-old kid, a 15-year-old kid, with an undeveloped brain and an undeveloped prefrontal cortex, a laundry list of drugs, narcotic drugs. And 10 years later, that same kid on those same drugs uh, picked up his 19-year-old passenger on his way to work, took a bunch of pills before he got in the car. Uh, under the influence, he fell asleep at the wheel, he nodded out, and drove full speed into the back of a flatbed truck, uh, killing his 19-year-old passenger. My friend Anthony was sentenced to seven years for vehicular manslaughter. Um, I talked to him through an app uh, on my phone. Uh, he's somewhere in a prison around here, like somewhere in South Jersey. Um, but I get a phone call when this happens from all my friends because at this point I'm sober and I'm working in the addiction field. And everyone says like, oh, I can't believe this happened. How did this happen? Anthony was such a good kid. How did this happen? And I start to get frustrated. We gave a kid a laundry list of drugs. His brain recognized those drugs as good. The reward system in his brain felt that and said, well, okay, this is good. And for the rest of his life, that became good. And over time, his brain and his body craved those drugs more than they craved food. If he had $10 left, he would spend his last $10 on drugs before he would spend it on food. That kid never stood a chance. What you guys need to understand is the younger you guys introduce substances into your brain, the more your chances of addiction skyrocket later in life. Um, so back to high school, uh, I go up to Anthony, I say, listen, I got a big match. I need a couple of pills. Anthony what's, is my best friend. What does he say? No, you shouldn't take drugs. No, that's not what he said. <laughs> no, he was like, here you go, dude. Here's a bunch of drugs. Uh, I took those two pills. I went up to that match. I took them. 
Uh, long story short, for the interest of time, I end up in overtime. The kid is completely dead. He could barely pick up his hands, and I'm full of energy. I know I'm going to win uh, just because this kid can't even breathe. Whistle blows. Uh, he shoots in. I spin behind. I score two points. I win, and we go on to win the match 31-30. Uh, uh, I won the first state sectional in my high school's history, and I did it high on Percocet. Who is going to tell me at 17 years old, after winning a state championship, after getting a girlfriend, after all the fun experiences that I've had under the influence of drugs and alcohol, who is going to tell me that they're bad at this point in my life? Nobody. This is the best slide I could find to describe myself as you guys right here in this school. Like, clearly, if you think drugs and alcohol are bad, you have no idea what you're talking about because your experience is not the experience I've been having. This stuff is good. Um, I, go to college, I go to college. I fail out real quick. Like I said, I'm learning disabled, whatever that means. I could have done college if I was interested. I really wasn't. I wasn't interested. Um, I was more interested in having fun and partying. I failed out of school. I got into the Stone Setters Union. This is me at 21, hanging off the corner of a building, 42 stories in the air in Manhattan. <coughs> I bought a Harley at 22. <coughs> Who's cooler than me right now? There's only one answer. Nobody. No, 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 no. Sorry. I'm 22 years old. <coughs> All my friends are in college. They're broke. I'm in the union making like $50 an hour. I have a Harley. I'm going to the bar whenever I want. Like, life is good. Um, <clears throat> I'm on a job with this guy, and he's got a bottle of pills. And I know immediately what they are. As soon as I heard him rattle, I was like, ooh, I know what those are. I said, let me get one of those. He's like, no, dude, we have a big day today. I can't have you all messed up. I was like, no, 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 that, that's, that's not what happens to me. I don't get messed up. Give me one of those pills. Watch, we're going to get everything done. He's like, all right, but if this doesn't work, I'm going to fire you. I'm like, give me that. So I take this pill. We normally do about four rows of stone. We banged out like six or seven that day. We did like double the work in one day. We put all the tools in the gang box. Guy's like, dude, you did great today, kid. I was like, I know, give me more of those pills tomorrow uh, and we could do this again. He said, did you get your insurance through the union yet? I said, yeah, I just got it. Like I just got it last month. He said, well, then you don't have to buy them off me. You can go to the doctor and get them yourself. Just tell them you got pain here, you got pain here. Lean a certain way when you walk through the door. Tell them what you do for a living and they'll write you a prescription. <clears throat> this opioid epidemic, this 93,000 people that die every year, it started because guys like me took advantage of doctors that were lied to by Big Pharma and got them to overprescribe us pills. And we flooded the streets with painkillers. The guy says to me, dude, I get so many pills a month, I could barely take them all. I sell most of them. I made like two to $3,000 last month selling pills. And I was like, wait a second, hold up. Took me like six months to save up six grand to buy that bike. And this guy tells me in two months I could buy another one. I was like, dude, I'm in, I don't know what kind of Ponzi scheme you're running, but I want some of this. So I go to the doctor, I get the pills, um, and I begin my life uh, as, a, as, as a drug dealer. Um, I had no idea at the time, but like this is when addiction really started to destroy my life, but it destroyed it from the inside. Like on the outside, everything seemed great. Like I could not tell that slowly my foundation was crumbling. Um, this was my weekend every weekend. Um, I, yeah, no, no, you can laugh because I thought this was, th I made this my Facebook profile picture because like look how much fun we had last weekend, you know what I mean? Like yeah, last weekend me and Matt got tore up. Um, there's a saying, the chains that bind you are too light to feel until they're too heavy to break off of you, right? The chains that hold you down, they're too light to feel until all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, this is a problem and I'm stuck, right? I had no idea that these pills were addictive. I had no idea that my tolerance was going up and up and up. I didn't know if I stopped taking them, I would get sick <clears throat> until um, they uh, shut down the, the doctors, they shut down the, they created a, a system where it linked the doctors, the pharmacies, and me. And all of a sudden I went from getting four or five prescriptions a month to one prescription for 120. And at this point, 
I was taking 20 pills a day. So I had enough pills to last me three or four days. Uh, and that's why I got sick for the first time. You guys know the Eminem song, like, I'm not afraid? You're not afraid. Remember that song? It's old now. There's a line in that song where he talks about his bones are doing jumping jacks. That's how I felt. He's talking about withdrawal, right? It felt like I was standing completely still, but my insides were just doing this. Um, I got sick for the first time. I didn't like that. Uh, I got introduced to heroin. Um, I uh, took that for the first time, and it felt exactly the same. Uh, it was at that moment I realized they're the exact same drug. Both come from a poppy plant. One comes from the doctor. One comes from the streets of Newark or for you guys, Camden, wherever. Uh, you know. And the next three years of my life, for lack of a better word, I was a full-blown heroin addict. Um, selling drugs, using drugs, doing whatever I needed to do to get by. Till finally, uh, 2016, I was driving my car. Um, anybody uh, know what, you guys, juniors, some of you guys have your licenses right now? Not most of you though, right? Anybody seen those black boxes on the back of cop cars? Yeah, do you know what it is, red mask? You've seen it. Okay, it's a plate scanner. Another side lesson, has nothing to do with vaping. Pay your tickets, right? You guys are new drivers. If you get a ticket, tell your parents about it and pay it. Because if you don't pay it, eventually the DMV will suspend your license. And when you pass one of those cop cars with that black box on it, it reads your license plate and it goes right to the computer inside the guy's car and it says, that's Phil O'Hara, go pull over Phil O'Hara, he's got a, a t an unpaid ticket, right? So. I left the house that morning and I saw a mail that said that my license was suspended because I didn't pay a ticket. So I knew if I passed one of those plate scanners, I was gonna get picked up. Um, I passed my first plate scanning cop on the day, I don't get pulled over. I passed my second one uh, and I don't get pulled over. But he was going fast this way, I was going fast that way, maybe he was in a rush. But like I started to get like a little nervous uh, and like a little paranoid. Um, and then finally I passed my third plate scanning cop on the day and this guy was parked right in Krausers and he was literally there to pull people over. Like it's a speed trap, right? So I'm like, oh, here we go. And I passed this plate scanning cop and I don't get pulled over. Uh, and I knew immediately um, that I was being followed, right? Because that's the kind of life that I was living. Uh, that if I'm not getting pulled over for a suspended license, they're not pulling me over for a reason and I was fairly certain I was uh, under investigation. And I was right, I was 100% right. Um, clever is the word to describe myself at that point. Um, clever is a good word because I don't wanna use the word smart because I did a lot of dumb things. But um, I was always very clever when it came to stuff like that. So I know that I'm in trouble. I drive right to my mom's office. Um, I run into her. Uh, I don't know, anybody ever seen the movie Goodfellas? Yeah, you know the part with the helicopters? He's like, ah, oh, the helicopters. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. His face is all messed up. He's all on drugs. He looks all terrible, right? I run into my mom's office looking awful. And I'm like, mom, I'm, I'm in a lot of trouble. She's like, slow down, what's going on? I said, listen, uh, I'm getting followed by the cops. I'm gonna go to prison. My mom, little four foot 11, uh, she was a cheerleading commissioner when I was a kid. She was a town councilwoman when I was a kid. She's on the board of ed now, which I think she's crazy. None of us are in school anymore, but she's on the board of ed, whatever. Uh, but my mom is a good, upstanding member of society. Uh, she doesn't have any tickets. She's never been in trouble. Um, I go into her office. I tell her I'm in a lot of trouble. She says, all right, uh, we'll get you a plane ticket. We'll fly you to Florida, uh, and you can go live with Aunt Donna. But what I couldn't tell my mom is like, I'm hopelessly addicted to heroin and I don't know whether there's heroin in Florida, so there's no way I'm going to Florida because I'm gonna get sick. So instead I make up some real quick lie. I'm like, no, 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 they'll catch me at the airport. Without a hesitation, I'm like, they'll catch me at the airport. Within a split second, she's like, all right, I'll rent a car from Hertz, I'll put you in the trunk and I'll drive you to Florida. Okay, gangster lady. You never committed a crime in your life, but you're gonna put me in the trunk and harbor a fugitive 18 hours to Florida. I love you to death, Ma. Respect the effort, but no. Um, my mom's great, uh, or as my therapist would call her, uh, an enabler. That was a joke, it was much funnier in my head. Um, no, but my mom, I could call my mom right now and say, hey listen, I'm at this high school in South Jersey, one of the kids was giving me a tough time. Long story short, I need you to bring me a shovel. 
my mom would say a flat shovel or a pointy shovel. You like that one? <laughs> my mom would say a flat shovel or a pointy shovel. And can you meet me halfway on the turnpike? Because like, I'm really not trying to drive that far. Um, my mom will do whatever it takes to keep me out of trouble. She's a mom. That's what moms do. Um, so I don't take her plan. I don't drive to Florida. Like I said, I'm very clever. Slightly stupid, but clever. Um, I know that my license is suspended. I get the bright idea to turn myself into the police department, pay my suspended license, and roll the dice. They're either going to arrest me and put me in the box like the first 48, or they're going to let me go. If they let me go, um, then they don't have enough on me to prosecute. Like, I've watched enough law and order to know. You know what I'm saying? They don't got enough on me. So I go in, I pay the suspended license, they let me go. Um, and I know I have to get out of there. I know that this has to end. This was my moment, that aha moment where my life needed to change. I made a phone call. I called my buddy Richie Bryant. He was uh, on the wrestling team that I was on in high school. He went to treatment a couple years earlier and, uh, and he's the one I called. I said, dude, I'm in a lot of trouble. I, I, I gotta get out of here, I wanna get better. He said, do you wanna get out of there because you're in trouble or do you wanna get better? He said, no, dude, I, I really wanna get better. Like, I'm tired, I don't wanna do this anymore. Uh, he said, all right, get on a plane and, uh, and come to my job, I, I, I have a place for you. I got on that plane and this uh, is my intake picture at Detox. Remember the story I told you where like everything felt good and it was fun and I had a lot of fun, right? Does that look like I'm having fun in this picture? No, right? I look like I'm dying. I look awful. What they didn't tell me in school is yes, drugs feel good at, at the beginning, but over time, the feeling of it's going really good, it feels good, to like this feels okay, to like I kinda just need this to operate, uh, to wow, my life is a living hell. I can't even get out of bed if I don't have a substance. I have to take things from people, I have to rob people, I have to lie, I have to cheat, I have to steal, and I'm completely miserable and dead inside. And that's the progression. But we don't tell you guys about the progression, we just tell you they're bad and they're gonna ruin your life, right? But the reality is in the beginning it actually kinda feels good. But in the end, this is how it goes. And for some people the end comes quick and for other people like my dad, my, I had to put my dad into treatment three times, right? So if you have a family member struggling, if you have a parent struggling, I know the struggle because I had to put my dad into treatment three times. It was the most difficult thing I've ever done. But at 58 years old, my dad finally got it. You know, my dad's sober today. Um, but like I said, for some of us, the end comes quick. For some of us, it takes a lot longer. So I ended up in that treatment center. I made the decision to change my life. Um, I knew that I was worth more. I knew that, you know, I had something to offer the world. Um, and I made that decision to change. I told you, I got mentors. Um, I started finding, you know, Richie was my first mentor. I leaned a lot on my wrestling coach. Uh, and then I met this guy, Michael DeLeon, uh, one of the greatest mentors in my life. Before I get into Michael, this is the picture before I left to go to Florida. Now I look awful in this picture, right? But look at my mom compared to here three years later. You could tell I'm sick and I look better here, but how does my mom look compared to the top? She looks way better in the bottom, right? because I was sucking the life out of my mother and I had no idea. When I look at this picture, I actually kind of feel bad. Even today, even though I'm doing great, like I put her through so much, but I didn't realize it at the time. Anyway, so I meet DeLeon, right? Um, I see him speak at this uh, convention. It was the Student Assistance Counselor Convention. I went there, saw him speak, and I had this goal, right? I wanted to speak in schools. I wanted to talk to you guys about the opioid opioid epidemic, like I was like hell bent on the opioid epidemic, that's all I wanted to talk about. So I go up to Michael and I said, listen, this is what I wanna do, uh, can you give me some pointers? He said, you could just do it with me. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I need people to go into schools. Like, I, like I've gone to these schools, like you guys, you've heard my story before, right, sorry. But he's like, I need, I need people to go to schools. So I was like, all right, I'm in. He said, you're gonna talk to him about your story. I said, yeah, he said, you're gonna talk to him about the, the 70 kids that you've lost from 2001, since my high school's lost 70, 70 students. You're gonna talk to them about that. I was like, all right, I'm in. He said, you're gonna talk to them about marijuana and vaping and e-cigarettes. And I was like, dude, you're out of your mind. Like, kids are dying and we're talking to them about 
about, about vaping? Like, are you serious? How much time we got? 20 minutes, perfect, way more than the last time. So he said, yeah, you're gonna talk to him about vaping. And I was like, dude, I'm not really interested in talking to kids about vaping. He said, listen, meet me, I wanna show you some slides. And I was like, all right, I'll meet you. He started talking to me about the trifecta gateway. Um, nicotine, alcohol, and marijuana consumption at a young age. He said, ask every kid inside your treatment center, uh, what was the first drugs they did, the first three drugs. And immediately at the table, I asked myself, and I was like, well, I smoked cigarettes, then I drank, and then I smoked weed. Okay, all right, I'm here, I'm listening. And then I went back and I asked every single person in my treatment center, and they all started with the same three drugs, nicotine, alcohol, and marijuana. He said, Phil, we're priming these kids' brains for addiction, and they don't even know it. 80% of alcohol consumed in America is consumed by 20% of the drinkers. Marijuana today, is 600% stronger than it was just five years ago. And he starts rattling off all these stats. And I'm like, all right, we'll put it all together. He said, Phil, this isn't about drugs. This isn't about specific substances. It's not about alcohol. It's not about marijuana. It's not about heroin. It's about the effect on their brain. It's about this prefrontal cortex, right? The younger that you guys use drugs, the more susceptible you are to addiction. This part of your brain, this prefrontal cortex, is control of all rational decision-making thoughts, right? Like anything that makes sense logically is processed in this part of your brain. Well, when you're addicted to drugs, you shut down that part of your brain. It does not work. What makes addiction a disease is that for the first 18 months you're sober, this part of your brain does not turn back on. You're running on survival instinct, right? Anybody that's raised their hand, that was strong enough to raise their hand, um, that deals with addiction in their family, has anybody in their family done something that was just like crazy, that like hurt the family, but like you know deep down that person loves you, but like can't comprehend why they did that, right? I'm gonna give it to you right now. It's not that they're a bad person, it's just that they need help. So, the part of your brain that says, I love you, I shouldn't have done whatever that thing was, wasn't working. The part of your brain that says, I need to survive, that was working. And survival to us means using drugs. There's another way I could shut down your prefrontal cortex right now and have you guys have that same brain reaction. Life or death situations, when you have a split second to think, this gets short-circuited and you go onto that part of your brain. Who knows what would happen right now if I sucked all the air out of this room and cut one human-shaped hole in that door. Who, give me two friends. You guys, you guys cool? Yeah? Your friends? Known each other a long time? Okay, if I sucked all the air out of this room, there was a hole in the back door that only one of you could get out of, only enough time for one person to escape. Are you guys still friends? No. No. What are you going to do when I suck the air out of the room? You're spreading out the door. What if he's in your way? You're going to push him down. You're going to take his hoodie and the back of his pants, and you're probably going to use his head to try and make the hole bigger before you jump out of it, and then you're going to step over his lifeless body and crawl your way to safety because you need to survive. It doesn't matter that you've known him forever. It doesn't matter that you're friends. None of that matters. What matters is survival. And that's the best analogy I could give you about whatever happened in your life, right? It's just survival. So you guys and this trifecta gateway are being primed for addiction. Nicotine is one of the most addictive substances we have. And we're using it at a rate that is skyrocketing in high schools and middle schools. Um, and in the middle of the biggest drug epidemic, you good over there? You good, Orange Hoodie? You good? You sure? Okay. All right. Um, in the middle of the biggest drug epidemic this country has ever seen, we are targeting you guys. We have sold you out to big tobacco, and you guys have been lied to. Who here thinks that... Um, Vaping is a safer alternative to smoking. Show of hands. Couple? Okay. 
Um, anybody under the myth that big tobacco has nothing to do with vaping? That, no? Okay, good, because that was the myth a couple of years ago. But big tobacco owns Juul. Big tobacco owns the major vaping cartridges. So you guys know what a vape is, right? I don't have to go through these slides. These are mostly for your parents. Usually they're like, oh my god, I thought that was a USB. All right. Let's get to how you're being targeted. 9.6 million through TV, 14.4 million through grocery stores. This is my favorite one to show because you could leave here and go see it at Wawa. You ever pull up to Wawa? You notice on those concrete bollards that keep you from crashing into the building, they have those cardboard cutouts for vapes. Whose eyes are at that level? Kids. A little kid literally gets out of a car and stares right at that thing, right? Are they targeting me with Fruity Pebble vape juice or that little kid, right? I mean, some of my friends smoke Fruity Pebble vape juice and I, I kind of make fun of them, but no, they're targeting kids. And here's why. All right, 2016, 32% of high school kids were smoking vapes, 32%. Remember that number, okay? <clears throat> when I was in high school, 30% of high school kids were smoking cigarettes. I was in high school in 2001, I'm old. Um, vaping was not a thing yet. Right, so 30% of my friends were smoking cigarettes. They started this big education campaign called Truth, right, that white commercial, uh, the orange commercial with the white bubbles, Truth. They started educating kids that cigarettes were killing people, right, and we're smart, kids are smart. Like, okay, this is clearly killing people, so I'm not gonna smoke. And we started to lower the teen nicotine rate. Year by year by year, it started to come down, and this, is big tobacco's profits going down the drain. This is all their new consumers. They're losing all of their new consumers until finally in 2011, when they cut it down by 50% and half of the people were smoking cigarettes or starting to smoke cigarettes, magically in 2011, this safer alternative to smoking came out and this big lie campaign happened. Oh, this is a safer alternative. As perception of harm goes down, teen use goes up. So in 2016, we were at 30%, 32% of high school kids vaping. How many kids in this school, percentage? How many kids are vaping now? 100%? Who else? 96? 65? It always varies, but a big, oh, sorry. Did I just get you? Did I get you? I'm sorry, buddy. I hit him with the laser. Um, 60 to 90% of high school kids are vaping on a regular basis. We took the teen use rate and doubled it and possibly tripled it for money. We sold you guys out for money. We have 90% of high school kids in some schools, 60 to 90% of high school kids vaping, 30 to 50% of middle school kids vaping the most addictive substance we have. Now you hear me talking about the brain and the younger you use and how more susceptible you are to addiction. So if I take a 13 year old kid and I get him completely addicted to nicotine at 13 and addiction is a progressive disease, what is he gonna be addicted to at 20? What is he gonna be addicted to at 25, right? We are creating the next class of drug addict right now. And it's you guys. You guys got sold out for money. What else is happening in this state right now? We legalize marijuana, right? Um, I forgot about a slide, I'm a little rusty. I haven't been doing this for two years. Coronavirus screwed me up. Before I get into the marijuana, what are you guys vaping, right? Guy in the last class is like, but we're just vaping water. No, you're not vaping water. You're vaping propylene glycol and vegetable oil. Um, both of these things are safe for human consumption when you eat it. However, there's no studies done on what happens when you atomize these substances, heat them to 200, 300 degrees, and put them in your lungs. Um, 
you're also going to see vapes as the next big drug delivery system, right? We're seeing it with dab pens already, right? You guys know what dabs are. Um, a couple years ago, there was a bust in Australia. They had 200 liters of liquid methamphetamine, and the news reported it as a new smuggling method into the country, that they're smuggling in this liquid in Coke bottles, and then they take it to a lab and they process it into crystal methamphetamine. That was, that was misinformation. They were not informed on what that really was. That was the methamphetamine in its finished form, right? When you see somebody smoking drugs on a sidewalk, it's alarming, the cops get called. But when you see somebody puffing on a vape pen, nobody says anything, right? And if you guys know what dab pens are, you know you've seen somebody at a restaurant smoking a dab pen right in the middle of the table. People have no idea what this is. This is gonna be the next big drug delivery system. Jewels are the most popular version of you guys smoking, young people smoking. And what's dangerous about that is Jewels use something called a nicotine salt. Nicotine salt uh, is more readily absorbed into the brain, uh, crossing the blood-brain barrier, impacting you harder, hitting you harder, affecting your brain more, causing more damage. <clears throat> All right, uh, what are you smoking? You're smoking formaldehyde, propylene glycol, dicytyl, lead, nickel, and then remember that dyslexic thing I told you about? I don't even try and pronounce that. If you wanna try and read it, you can. Um, but let's start with dicytyl. Dicytyl is a highly toxic chemical compound that is very dangerous to not only people who work with it, but also to consumers. Dicytyl exposure can cause permanent, severe, and potentially lethal lung disease in workers and consumers. Um, this is the leading causes of death in this country. Respiratory disorders are number three. Cancer is number two. Heart and circulatory disorders, heart attacks is number one. Over the next 10 years, you are going to see respiratory disorders overtake cancer as a leading cause of death in this country due to vaping. Uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome and popcorn lung. Yes, eight minutes, all right. So. Let's get to THC. We're legalizing marijuana in this state, right? Because it's safe, or that's what we've been told. Um, but here's what the legislators either don't care to know or are 100% ignoring, because I've tried to talk to them about it, and they just don't want to hear it, <clears throat> because they financially benefit from the tax that's going to come from this. So this is THC rates in this country from 1960 to 2011. With natural farming techniques, like the earth and sun, uh, we were able to get THC rates up to about 12% in the plant. In 2013, we legalized it in Colorado, we handed it over to scientists, and we commercialized marijuana. And with GMOs and pesticides, in a couple of years, with science, they were able to take those percentages and double them to 35%, more than double them. Um, and that's 2015. We're seeing uh, plants being tested up to 60% pure THC. That's not natural, that's science. We took it a step further. We made dab pens, right? We shot bupane and propane through the weed, coming up with this, THC oils. THC concentrates, 90% um, pure THC. You are going to see, if you haven't seen it already, psychosis. So I gotta be honest with you, when he first told me about the marijuana stuff, I wasn't really thrilled about telling you guys this information because I hadn't seen it from my own eyes yet and I didn't really believe that people could go into psychosis until I got a phone call to do an intervention I went and this, I got there and this kid was talking about hearing voices and seeing demons. And I was like, all right, dude, like how much methamphetamine did you take? He's like, no, 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 I just smoked weed. And I'm like, did you take any like hallucinogenics? He said, no, 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 just, just my weed pen. Uh, I didn't believe him, but I got him to a facility and we tested his blood and the only thing in his blood was THC. He was smoking concentrated THC. Some people's brains are able to absorb it and they just get high and other people's, they are not able to deal with it. Uh, 
bipolar uh, and schizophrenia are the two things that we're seeing. I've done five interventions in the last three years on kids that were in full-blown manic episodes from smoking THC pens. There's too much butane or propane left in the oil, and it's causing people to freak out. This is 100% pure THC. Uh, where is it? This is a new slide. Um, Cannabis-induced psychosis has increased 600% in adults and 1,500% in adolescents in 2009. This is real stats, right? So um, you guys need to be aware that what they are telling you is safe is it? They told my generation that opioid painkillers were non-addictive. And I've lost 70 of my friends since 2001. They made a lot of money off that lie. Not everybody in this world, like here's the sad truth of what I'm gonna tell you. Because I remember being in school and like thinking that like the world was a good place, and it can be. But I never really understood that there's people out there that really don't care if I succeed. There's people out there that make a lot of money off pain. And the same lie I was told is a lie that you were being told. This stuff is not safe, right? You guys have to take this information and do with it what you wish. Because like I said, I can't tell you what to do. All I can do is educate you and treat you like adults. Um, so what I want to say before I leave is uh, the longer you guys wait, the better off you are. I know it's a lot for me to ask to wait till you're 26 to when your brain's developed. I know that's a lot. I know it's a lot for me to wait till you're 21. Say, hey, don't, don't drink till you're 21. I know that's a lot. All I'm asking you is to wait as long as possible, as long as possible to mess around with any type of substance. The longer you guys wait, the better off you are. Um, and the other thing I want to say is, if you guys are struggling, like, you know, I, I, I have a, a student that I helped, um, and, you know, she talks about when the lockdown came. You know, everyone was all excited that we were getting locked down because we didn't have to come to school, but all she thought about was, damn, I have to go home and deal with my mom. Her mom was actively smoking crack in the home. Her mom was an alcoholic. Her mom was very abusive. So this poor kid was the only kid in school, and everyone's like, yeah, we're getting locked out. She's like, damn, I gotta go home and deal with mom now, right? I know that stuff is going on that you guys are afraid to talk about. You don't have to talk to me about it here. This is my information if you need me. If you need to talk, if you need anything, I can't tell you how many times I have come to speak in a school, and a week later I was back at somebody's health house doing an intervention on either mom, dad, sister, brother, um, if you guys are struggling with this in your home or anything, just reach out to me. Uh, I'll answer and we'll figure out a way to help. All right? So much time. Pretty much it. Anybody got a question? Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. You can do that. Thanks. Nobody has any questions? All right, cool. You guys did great. Thanks for giving me your time. Good. What? What happened to the girlfriend? You found his wife. Oh, I, I met my wife. I got my wife. We got married in July. No other questions? Again, for Mr. O'Hara. Let me hear you. Phil O'Hara. Can we do a boomerang? You guys cool with a boomerang? Yeah? yeah? All right, cool. All right, we're going to sit tight for about another minute or two because the classes are switching. When you leave here, go to period four. If you have lunch, you'll go to lunch or to period four or five. So you're going to four or four or five, depending on what you have. We're going to give it about a minute or so to the halls clear a little bit.
If you're coming in for subs right now, you can come in, just stay towards the back. All right, guys, you can head to your next class. Have a great day, everyone.